All right. Very good. Got it started to record. All right, everybody. I want to thank you for showing up for today's Mid-Atlantic Territory webinar. I'm real excited about today's webinar. We always are getting questions about clinical trials and research and um, no better person to speak on this as Dr. Marigakis from Johns Hopkins. So Dr. Marigakis is the medical director of Johns Hopkins ALS Clinical Trials Unit and director of the ALS Center for Cell Therapy and Regeneration Research. He's also a professor of neurology at Johns Hopkins University. He's the director of the Center for ALS Specialty Care at Johns Hopkins. And that is a world, that clinic is a world recognized leader in providing medical care and offering the latest in clinical trials and therapy to ALS patients. So as I said, no better person to speak on today's topic than Dr. Marigakis. So Dr. Marigakis, thank you so very much. I am going to um, lead, give the floor to you. And oh, before I do that, what we're going to do, folks, if you have any questions, at mine's at the bottom of my screen. Sometimes it's at the top of the screen. There's something that says a Q&A. If you go ahead and put your questions in there, we will answer as much as we can till two o'clock. So, Dr. Marigakis, I am going to send it over to you. Thanks, Jerry, for the introduction and um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm going to tell you today a little bit about some of the new horizons for ALS therapeutics. My intention is not to touch on every single clinical trial um, out there because there are a, a number of them, but hopefully to give you a flavor of how we as clinicians and clinician scientists are thinking about the next year um, with respect to some interesting categories of um, clinical research and even uh, preclinical research. Um, so I'm going to touch on a variety of, uh, of different topics. So um, thank you again for the invitation. So these are my disclosures. Uh, so these are the objectives, uh, to look at the epidemiology of ALS, give you a, a brief background, some of the pathophysiology of ALS, which will be, I think, relevant as we think about and talk about um, different ALS relevant targets. We're gonna talk about physiology and its relationship to clinical symptoms and signs, how an ALS diagnosis is made, um, and finally talk about um, disease management and, and therapies. So as, as most of you know, ALS is a, is a common motor neuron disease. While the annual incidence of ALS is about two to three per 100,000, the lifetime risk has been estimated to be as much as one in 300 individuals. And while we say that the mean age of onset for ALS is about 56 years of age, we certainly see a broad range of patients uh, in their 20s all the way into their, uh, into their 80s. And it's probably the case that ALS prevalence has, uh, has slowly increased over time. That's uh, thought in part to potentially being related to uh, the, aging, uh, the aging population. So ALS really is a disease that is the selective generation of what we call upper motor neurons. Um, and those are the um, cells up here in the brain, uh, highlighted in red. And they send their projections to what we call lower motor neurons that exist in the spinal cord as well as in, in the brain stem. And so um, after the synapse or after the uh, uh, communication between the red cells and the blue cells, those blue cells subsequently send projections out into the muscle. So it's a combination of these features that is a loss of cells, both the red cells and the blue cells, the upper and lower motor neurons respectively, that um, gives us a, a, a phenotype of ALS. What we're learning now more than ever is that while the vast majority of patients have what we consider to be sporadic disease, that is, there's no obvious family history nor obvious related genes that trigger the development of ALS. There's an important subcomponent, maybe as much as 10% of ALS patients, for which it runs in families. And now, importantly for our understanding of ALS and our development of preclinical models, and um, there have been a number of genes that have been discovered that account for these hereditary forms of ALS. And if you look worldwide, 
the most common gene is this gene called C9 or 72, and it can account for up to 7% of patients with ALS. A, a subset of patients, maybe 1% of all ALS patients, all ALS patients, carry a, a, a mutation in the gene called SOD1. And that's important, particularly now more than ever, because there has been a therapy that's been developed to treat patients with the SOD1 mutation, and I'll touch on that. We're also increasingly appreciating that um, some patients have uh, called frontotemporal dementia, called FTD, maybe up to 15% of patients. Important to um, all of sporadic ALS or all of ALS is that is that something we see when we look at patient brains or spinal cords, that is a, a, the aggregation of a protein called TDP43. And TDP43 has really become a fundamental player in the development of ALS and a fundamental potential ALS target for therapies. This uh, TDP43 is a protein that normally resides in the nucleus that you can see um, here in uh, blue. These are um, nuclei of brain cells. And this protein is involved in what we call nuclear RNA metabolism. And in ALS, there's a loss of this nuclear TDP43. And in fact, you can see um, in some cases that the brown staining, which is the TDP43, uh, exists outside of this blue nucleus. That is, it's been extruded from the nucleus of the cell. So it's supposed to be in the nucleus. It's sitting in what we call the cytoplasm. And this can be demonstrated here on the right. So the cytoplasm is not where this protein needs to be but that's where it ends up in uh, most ALS patients. So there's an enormous focus right now on getting this protein back to where it belongs in the nucleus. So how do we make a diagnosis of ALS? We take a relevant history, of course, that's really important. In fact, most diagnoses are made up based on the history alone. Then we also do um, a neurological examination, those can be included with EMG, uh, nerve conduction studies, imaging studies, blood and biomarker tests, um, spirometry to assess respiratory function, and ALS genetic testing. And we're offering now genetic testing for all of our ALS patients. We think that's particularly important given now that there are some potential uh, treatments uh, specifically targeting these ALS mutations. How, how, do we, um, how do we treat the disease? through respiratory um, support, nutritional support, physical and occupational therapy, exercise, even cognitive therapy, multidisciplinary care that involves care in a multidisciplinary clinic, much like those associated with the ALS Association. We, of course, try to encourage patients to participate in clinical trials. And of course, there are some approved drug therapies for uh, ALS, and I'll touch on those. The focus for today is not so much to to analyze how current management is, is undertaken, but rather to talk about clinical trials. There are lots of mechanisms behind ALS pathogenesis. And I put this slide up, it's a very busy slide, but just to really demonstrate right here in the middle, you see this is a neuron or a nerve cell talking to a, a second nerve cell downstream. And you can see all of these different arrows represent um, relevant uh, 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 pathologies and relevant pathological cascades thought to be involved in ALS. So ALS is probably not just one disease, but probably represents the interactions between a lot of different uh, ALS relevant pathways. What are the known um, uh, and approved therapeutic targets for ALS, at least here in the United States? And many of you probably know about Riluzol, also known as Rilutec, and it works by inhibiting right where you see this blue circle, the release of glutamate from what we call presynaptic neurons as they talk to the postsynaptic neurons. And when glutamate is released from this synaptic cleft, there's too much glutamate released when a cell dies. And by releasing all that glutamate, it subsequently initiates a chain reaction of additional cell death. So Riluzol blocks the release of this glutamate and protects nerve cells from dying. Its effect is relatively modest. It's thought to prolong survival by about three months. And it's taken twice a day, roughly every 12 hours. It's relatively well tolerated, but does require some monitoring of uh, liver enzymes. You know, it's relatively inexpensive when compared with um, other therapies, like the ones uh, that I talk about now. 
Aderivone, also known as Radicava, is a free radical scavenger, which is first designed as a therapy for acute stroke in Japan. Studies in ALS suggest that in a subpopulation of ALS, particularly those with relatively high function, um, uh, that the this medication slows disease progression over a six month period. In fact, it's about a 33% additional effect to Riluzol itself in slowing disease progression. It's administered orally now. It used to be only available intravenously. And it's given in cycles of roughly 10 days uh, out of the month. The most common side effect are thought to be headache, bruising, and some difficulty with balance. Um, uh, somewhat challenging is the fact that it um, the cost is estimated at about $170,000 per year. The IV formulation was made available in 2017, but now it's available orally by mouth uh, since uh, really over the last uh, year and a half or so. And it acts by I'm inhibiting what we call reactive oxygen species production within this mitochondria that you uh, can see here. So that's the mechanism by which this medication is believed to act. Uh, a third drug has now been approved in the US. It's a drug called Relivrio. In fact, it's a combination of two medicines, both sodium phenylbutyrate, as well as a medication called Tudka. And it's thought to act in a couple of different ways by reducing reactive oxygen species production and by modulating um, mechanisms of what we call apoptosis, as well as um, uh, being involved in the uh, formation or uh, modulation of the breakdown of proteins. So it's also available orally, it's $150,000 at least per year. But one challenging issue with this medication is it does have, tend to have some GI side effects that are most frequent in the first three weeks when patients start taking the drug. Many of you uh, may know that it also doesn't taste very good um, either. So this medication is now available in the States. Um, what we don't know about the combination of these medicines is how well they now work together. Is there an additive effect with Riluzol, Radicava, and Relivrio? Those are data that we really don't know. Importantly, um, there's a phase three study, and I'm going to talk about different phases of trials uh, a little bit later, but um, uh, uh, of this drug called AMX035, it's the same drug as Relivrio. And there's a very large international study called the Phoenix trial. It's uh, almost a two-year study. Um, I'm sorry, almost a, it's a, almost a one-year study um, to evaluate the safety and efficacy of this particular medication. This is being um, performed internationally, um, and it uh, has a lot of patients, uh, 660 people across 69 sites in Europe and the US. And the results of this uh, trial, which is an, uh, the next step of the previous uh, trial, will be available probably in mid-2024, and will help us understand whether it will be approved in other parts of the world besides the US. I want to switch to what we call antisense oligonucleide gene therapies. Maybe you've heard about gene therapies. These are um, therapies that um, whereby which the medicine is specifically targeted to uh, uh, specific uh, genes within the brain and the spinal cord. And that's why I encourage patients to have genetic testing because we have to know the specific gene potentially causing their disease. So once that medicine binds to the gene, it results in a breakdown of that, um, of that gene and of that protein that results in a reduction of the abnormal or disease-causing protein. Unfortunately, this has to be given um, by a lumbar puncture. And so it's given every, depending on the drug, every um, uh, a couple of months uh, to reach the brain and the spinal cord. There was an important study called the Valor study, which was initially a phase one study of this drug, which is now referred to as Tofersen. Maybe you've heard about it. It was given to patients with ALS whose disease was caused by this SOD1 mutation that I mentioned earlier. It's only about 1% of all ALS patients, but important, um, uh, an important subset of patients because this gene therapy specifically targeted that um, abnormal protein as well as the wild type protein. So we, we felt that if we could reduce the amount of this toxic SOD1 protein, the potentially uh, disease could be um, uh, modified or slowed down. 
So in that study, the it did not achieve its what we call its statistical significance. That is, over a six month period, it didn't significantly slow disease progression. But what it did do is reduce the um, the amount of protein in the cerebrospinal fluid, and it also reduced something called NFL, which is neurofilament. Maybe you've heard of it, and neurofilament light, and that's a biomarker of ALS disease progression. So. Investigators were very encouraged by the fact that it reached its target and did what it's supposed to do, even if the effects were not very dramatic after six months of time. So what happened next? These are results now that were just presented in the International Motor Neuron Disease Meeting in Switzerland that I attended uh, last week. What they did was then they started to look at patients who were receiving this drug over a two year period now. So they've been receiving it now for two years instead of just the original six month period. So what happened is this, this Tofersen medicine re resulted in a 60 to 70% reduction in neurofilament protein over the two year period, suggesting that it's having an effect on nerves and nerve breakdown. Patients who were treated very early with Tofersen uh, had a slowing of their decline in function, a slowing of their decline in strength, and a slowing in their decline of quality of life over that two year period. In fact, in some patients, there was an improvement in function and strength in a subset of participants. Um, ra so rather than just slowing down progression, some patients stabilized and even began to improve to some degree their uh, strength. It also reduced the risk of death over time, and it resulted in approximately one and a half year extension of survival, particularly in those patients who tended to progress very rapidly, that is, over a period of months. So these are very exciting data to suggest that if we can knock down this particular protein using this gene strategy, that we may be able to even halt the progression of disease. And it was generally well tolerated. So despite these modest successes in ALS therapeutics, we really must do better. So there are, the good news is that there are a lot of clinical trials that are being uh, generated in ALS. And this is a graph over the last number of years that really shows how that the numbers of clinical trials have been increasing over time. And in fact, phase one, two, and three trials are now either recruiting participants or active. And again, this is nationally as well as internationally. A broad spectrum of ALS therapeutics are now being targeted. The emphasis currently is to try to do relatively short double blind phases, ideally six months, followed by open label extension studies where everyone gets drug. However, this could change with, um, with investigators potentially favoring longer trials, maybe up to a year, to really establish whether the findings that we're seeing at six months are meaningful long term. We're getting more input from people with ALS regarding clinical trial design, and we're stratifying patients by their genetic background, their disease severity, or their, even their disease progression trying to understand if some patients may be more responsive than others to a particular therapy. We're now also uh, routinely uh, including exploratory biomarkers uh, in all of these studies so we can try to understand um, if there are certain signals that we can measure that might be relevant to the um, disease as a whole. So what are the different phases of clinical trials? I'm oftentimes asked that. A phase one study, is a study where researchers generally test a new drug candidate in healthy volunteers or potentially in patients, um, in patients with a particular disease. The purpose really of a phase one study is really to evaluate the safety of a new drug candidate before it proceeds further into clinical studies. And we can answer those questions in a phase one trial about how much drug is available or how much drug needs to be given and if there are any a serious side effects associated with these medications. A phase two study, research has ministered drugs to a larger group of patients, maybe a few hundred patients with the disease, to assess its effectiveness and to further study its safety. A key phase of phase two studies is determining the optimal dose or doses of a drug candidate. In order to identify um, and, and maximize the possible benefits of the drug, for example, using a higher dose while minimizing the risks or side effects. And then phase three studies are what we oftentimes call pivotal studies. Phase three studies usually involve hundreds of patients for populations in which it's going to be used. 
Patients typically um, are being evaluated either with the medication or a control group that may receive a placebo medication. And that's very standard um, for phase three studies. Researchers designed phase three studies, among other things, to determine whether a drug um, is a candidate for uh, approval by the FDA and to whether it's safe um, to, go, uh, to go on to further development. And so once these phase three studies are completed, um, a company can submit what we call a new drug application. That is asking the Food and Drug Administration for approval to uh, register and subsequently market this for use by the general population. So I've talked to you a little bit about different phases of a trial, but I wanna to talk to you a little bit about um, expanding drug therapies. You know, Typically we might see when a drug works for one disease, you see a lot of copycats, let's say, or different variations of a drug or a drug candidate. Maybe it's a longer acting medicine, maybe it's given in a different form. Um, and we see these, we even call some of these generics um, once, um, once a drug gets approved. So now that we know that there is an there is an efficacious medicine, this antisense oligonucleotide targeting targeting patients with the SOD1 mutation, there are now some additional studies or some new companies that are entering the fray to try to uh, target this same protein in a different way. For example, one from a company called Unicure is a designed to be a one-time administered medication or gene therapy. Uh, for those patients who have the SOD1 mutation related to ALS. And that's important because unlike getting a lumbar puncture uh, every two months for the years, essentially, this is designed to be a one-time therapy. It's a very different strategy, but you will be seeing uh, this study come to fruition in the next little while to assess the safety and tolerability and potentially how well it works in, um, in patients with the SOD1 form of ALS. A second company is doing something a little bit different uh, to target the ALS uh, SOD1 mutation. They are looking at specifically targeting the defective part of the SOD1 protein. And in fact, unlike the antisense oligonucleotide, this isn't actually an antibody that is given to patients. So a little bit different strategy. Think of it as a different formulation, if you will, to do largely the same thing. A third company called Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals is um, designing a slightly different medication to, uh, again, turn off the gene that uh, contributes uh, to the SOD1 form of ALS. So hopefully this demonstrates to you that once some form of the uh, therapy has been established, other, uh, there are other opportunities then to try to modify or develop different drugs with that same target. So are there other gene therapies for targets in development besides the SOD1 gene? In fact, there are. One is for a, uh, a gene whoops, a gene called ataxin 2 and that study is still active. In other words, there are still patients in that study, but we're not currently enrolling uh, new patients. There's also a study to evaluate the efficacy and safety for those patients who are carrying what we call a fused in sarcoma mutation called FUS ALS. And again, this is a very small percentage of patients, just really a, um, a few dozen patients probably in this country, but it does represent a broadening of these gene therapy protocols. And they're going to be more on the horizon for different ALS relevant targets. I told you earlier about this um, protein called TDP43. And TDP43 should be in the nucleus of the cell, like I'm showing you here but for reasons we're trying to understand, gets stuck here in the cytoplasm and forms these, um, what we call inclusions that are very um, insoluble and the protein doesn't do the right thing. So the question is, are there ways of dissolving these inclusions here? And are there ways of getting this protein back into the nucleus where it belongs? Well, in fact, there are a variety of different strategies you can see in this upper right-hand corner. I'm not going to belabor the necessarily the science behind it, but what I hope you can appreciate is there are a number of different pathways or a number of different relevant targets of TDP43 that can be modulated as a potential ALS relevant therapy. And in fact, we're seeing that with two medications um, that I'm gonna show you. There's this um, enzyme called PIK5, and there was this very important study in um, 
in stem cells that demonstrated that if you uh, inhibit this PIK5 enzyme, that in fact you can get rid of these uh, protein inclusions like TDP43 or these uh, protein inclusions called dipeptide repeats or di dipeptide repeat proteins that occur in other forms of ALS. That is helping the cell take out the garbage, if you will, getting rid of these particular proteins that aren't where they belong. So there are two PIK5 inhibitor medications, one from a company called Takeda, and um, uh, that's now, uh, uh, was the company called Acuristem, and it's an antisense oligonucleotide um, designed to increase the number of lysosomes, or if you think about it as a, uh, taking, out the, taking out the trash, to get rid of this uh, misfolded or aberrantly targeted TDP43. So getting rid of it from the cytoplasm and potentially getting it where it belongs. And that's been studied in human-induced pluripotent stem cells. Another company called AI Therapeutics is studying a, uh, a, a slightly different drug called LAM2A in patients with the C9 or 72 mutation. That's a clinical trial that is active, but not uh, recruiting new patients. But it's a way of actually getting rid of these, what we call dipeptide repeats or DPRs. And so the details aren't so much important there, but really I want the take home message for you would be that there are current strategies to try to um, take out the misfolded uh, uh, TDP43 inclusions or dipeptide repeats, get them out of the cell uh, so they don't cause further damage. What about the evolution of stem cells as potential ALS therapeutics? Certainly you've heard about stem cells and, and their potential for ALS therapies. Over the last two decades, there's been enormous interest and enormous investment in examining whether stem cell-derived neurons or astrocytes could be transplanted into ALS mouse models or even patients as a therapeutic approach. More recently, an alternative approach has been to use autologous what we call mesenchymal stem cells, autologous meaning coming from the same patient, from patient bone marrow typically, uh, doing something to those mesenchymal stem cells and then transplanting them or infusing them back into the, to the spinal fluid to potentially allow them to release what we call neurotrophic factors. So there are a variety of different sources for stem cells and the purpose of this is a, could be a lecture in and of itself but a lot of sources of stem cells that can be um, made uh, or further differentiated in, into a cell type of interest and then put into, let's say, the spinal fluid, potentially into the spinal cord, or potentially even into muscle with a variety of downstream effects. So briefly, there's a company called Core Stem. Uh, they have a drug called Neuronata, which is, these are mesenchymal stem cells in South Korea, which were approved for use in South Korea. There's a, a clinical trial that has been, is active but not enrolling by which these uh, uh, bone marrows are then, uh, uh, bone marrow stem cells are uh, subsequently injected into the spinal fluid. And the results are actually um, uh, encouraging to suggest that potentially these stem cells could be um, beneficial in the context of ALS. And how do they do that? Um, you can see here through this diagram, they probably act through modulating the immune system and reducing neuroinflammation or reducing neuroinflammatory cascades. In addition, they probably also release things called neurotrophic factors, which encourage uh, nerve outgrowth uh, into, the, um, into the muscle. So there are probably many ways by which these cells could be active. Perhaps you've heard of a company called Brainstorm. They had a stem cell type called Neuron, and this was also an autologous stem cell transplantation. The FDA advisory committee um, voted 17 to one in September of 23. Uh, to, uh, they, they voted against approving this cell therapeutic for ALS. And there, was, there were concerns about the potential safety um, and the efficacy of these stem cells following transplantation. So uh, uh, the company has sent out a press release saying they plan to conduct a phase three trial, which will be a much larger trial in patients with ALS. I don't have a, a timeline on when that might occur.
How about modulating neuroinflammatory or autoimmune cascades of ALS? Well, there um, is a study that has been uh, um, carried out in Europe called MiroCALS, Modifying Immune Responses and Outcomes in ALS. And this is the clinicaltrials.gov uh, registry if you're interested. This is a low dose of a, of a protein called interleukin-2 that controls a molecule um, that can um, control immune regulation of these cells called Tregs or regulatory T cells. And at low doses, this IL-2 has been shown to increase the number of Treg cells uh, in the blood. And so the results of this study suggested there was a moderate decrease in the risk of death in patients who had this IL-2 treatment. This effect was an interesting trend, but not necessarily statistically significant. However, um, when they looked at a, uh, analysis of the primary survival endpoint, uh, based on the, uh, the biomarker I told you called neurofilament, there was a, a, a meaningful reduction of this neurofilament protein um, uh, that was felt to be uh, that was felt to be relevant. So this biomarker is being used now as a potential uh, hint, if you will, or a potential analysis of whether these drugs may be effective. So more to come potentially on this uh, medication with regard to ALS treatment. Like I said, the majority of this work was carried out in by our European colleagues. Uh, here in the United States, as well as internationally, we are currently in the process of conducting a phase two study for this uh, drug you see, uh, SAR443820. This is called the Himalaya study sponsored by a company called Sanofi. It targets an enzyme called RIPK1. And RIPK1 is important because it seems to regulate inflammation, cytokine release, and cell death. And so the idea behind this drug is it would inhibit the activity of this enzyme and put the brakes on these neuroinflammatory cascades. It's taken by mouth. And the study is a six week, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a six month study uh, in patients with ALS. And so we don't yet know the results of this study, but certainly it's an interesting therapeutic target. Well, in a very different way, what are some of the um, other strategies used as we think about ALS, ALS management and the future of ALS therapeutics? One are these ideas about brain-computer interfaces, that is, um, uh, implantable uh, devices that can sit on top of the brain and allow patients with ALS who may have, may have otherwise difficulty moving or communicating to interact with their environment. And you're seeing a publication I've um, shown here, which was just published uh, last month. So patients with ALS often lose the ability to communicate, um, detrimentally affecting their quality of life. The currently available tools are very slow and cumbersome, but one solution to restore communication is to decode signals directly from the brain to enable um, speech prosthesis, that is to recapitulate what we um, might see when a patient's speaking. This decoding has been limited by coarse neural recordings that don't really capture um, how the brain works and how the brain produces speech. So the use of these high resolution microelectrocorticographic neural recordings may be useful in this. And again, I, I'm showing you the publication that demonstrated exactly what I've um, shown you. We're actually studying um, a form of this here at Johns Hopkins, uh, a study called Corticom. It's a tr clinical trial of um, uh, uh, a brain computer interface. And this is being conducted by my colleague who is actually a specialist in epilepsy but is a specialist in brain computer, computer interfaces. And you can see here a picture of a, uh, a patient's brain and these white dots are essentially electrodes that are implanted surgically inside or on the patient um, surface of the patient's brain. And then through a little um, device here can be attached to an outside cord that can be um, subsequently uh, recording, those brain, uh, recording those brain signals. And what happens? Uh, it turns out that by recording brain signals in a very sophisticated way, um, and in current work going on, uh, patients have the ability to potentially um, create uh, speech uh, sounds and actually to do a variety of things that they might other do with their, um, with their upper extremities. So it's a way of carrying out tasks 
working with a computer interface to carry out tasks to improve quality of life and potentially to do things like turn on and off lights, uh, communicate with other individuals and so forth. So more here is, uh, there is definitely more to come as the technology improves. And this is a current clinical trial occurring at Johns Hopkins that is ongoing. One question might be, um, there's been some interest in whether muscle might be an effective or a, a viable target in ALS. And at this meeting um, uh, just recently, the results of this study called the Courage ALS study, whereby which uh, a drug called Reldeceptive, uh, which acts on the muscle, was studied in the context of ALS, really asking the question, if you target muscle, can you slow down disease progression, improve breathing function, or some other forms of, of function? So this was a, excuse me, this was a, a 24 week uh, study that was blinded and then it went to an open label extension. The data monitoring committee that you see here in red reviewed the unblinded data from this Courage ALS study and recommended the discontinuation of this clinical trial for what we call futility. That is, it was not felt that this medication called Reldeceptive was having an effect um, that was um, large enough to be meaningful in the context of ALS. And these results are very similar to another study that was reported maybe in the last two years for a very different drug called Levosimindan that also targeted muscle. And it was also not found to be uh, helpful in ALS patients either. So does that mean that we shouldn't be targeting muscle anymore in ALS? I think the jury is out a little bit. I think there are other potential muscle targets, but I think for the time being, uh, we probably will not see much in the way of uh, muscle as a target for ALS therapies. The focus will be more on nerves. The Healy platform trial deserves a couple of um, uh, words. It's a it's a essentially a national trial um, centered at, at the Healy Center at Mass General, and the idea really is uh, is this. Um, for every 10 therapies tested, traditionally about 2,400 patients or participants with ALS and 1,200 uh, receiving placebo would have to be enrolled. And this can take years, maybe as long as 12 years to do that via the traditional path. The question is, can we shorten that time by studying several, um, several therapies in parallel? Um, and that's why it's called a platform study, reducing this from 12 years to potentially four years. And so this requires only 1,600 participants with 400 receiving placebo. So how does it work? Um, the uh, Healy platform trial can study several medications, let's say therapies A, B, and C, all in parallel. And for every three patients that get active drug, only one patient gets what we call the placebo. And if you run three, three different drugs at the same time, the placebos can be what we call shared. So there are three shared placebos against three patients with active, uh, with active drug in every category. So it's this shared placebo concept. But within each trial, three patients get drug for every one placebo, thus increasing the number of patients in an individual trial who will get a medication. And so then after the patient, the six month double-blinded period, this goes to an open-label extension study. And after those are over, patients can actually re-enroll to be uh, back in the platform study and can potentially receive additional drug therapies. So there have been several what we call regimens to date. Regimen A, which was the first drug, was from Raw Pharmaceuticals, a drug called Xyluclopan, and it was stopped early for futility, meaning it was not felt that it would um, uh, work very effectively. Regimen, sorry, regimen B um, is from a company called Biohaven. It was a drug called Verdipristat, and its primary and secondary endpoints were not met, so there's no current uh, uh, further development plan to my knowledge. Regimen C is clean nanomedicine, a drug called CNMAU8, while its primary endpoint for success was not met, there were some interesting secondary endpoints which showed reduction in the risk of death in a 30 milligram group. So I think more to potentially come from that uh, effort. Prolenia Therapeutics had a drug called Prodopidine, 
and its primary endpoint was not met, but there were some positive trends among participants receiving the medication um, across some ex what we call exploratory measures. So I think potentially uh, more interesting news for, to come with regard to that medication. Regimen E is from a company called Celos Therapeutics. The drug is called Triolose. Enrollment is complete, but we don't have any data regarding uh, if this was effective. Regimen F is um, uh, the drug that you see at the right, and Regimen G are uh, now recruiting uh, patients for potential enrollment into those two regimens. I think there will also be additional regimens uh, to, well, I'm quite certain there will be additional regimens to come as part of the uh, Healy trial. Well, I think we're entering a new phase uh, uh, over the last five years, at least, and I think that will gain steam, and that is uh, assessment of biomarkers. These are critical components for the design of ALS therapeutic strategies. And these fall into several categories. Diagnostic biomarkers, for example, that is a disease characteristic that is related to the presence or absence of a pathophysiological state. That is, it helps with diagnosis of a disease. Prognostic biomarkers tell us about the natural history of the disease and the absence of therapy. So there's interest in stratifying ALS patients as to whether, let's say they're fast progressing or slow progressing. There are predictive biomarkers, that's a baseline characteristic that tells us the potential for um, a patient to respond to a particular type of drug. And finally, pharmacodynamic markers, which are measures in the blood or in the spinal fluid that change in response to a therapeutic intervention. These are not unique to ALS, certainly. They're used certainly in cancer and other disorders as well. So we're actually, uh, we have a study here at Johns Hopkins where we're actually doing imaging of the brain using a PET ligand to look at a biomarker of, uh, of brain inflammation. It's called, uh, it's called this fancy name, CPPC. And what is it? It's a biomarker study that allows us to look at inflammation within the brain. And I've shown you that uh, in this picture, that this might be the baseline um, neuroinflammation activity. In this case, it's an Alzheimer's disease patient. And if you block it with a specific drug, you can see, I hope you can appreciate the changes in color when we image uh, these brain slices. And so again, these are potentially um, important um, biomarkers for these patients. We're also going to be studying, this was a recently funded uh, Department of Defense study uh, that will be a study here at Johns Hopkins of the effects of psilocybin in patients with ALS. Potentially, you know, these as the components for uh, in some uh, forms of mushrooms. So these are thought as psychedelics, but they've been shown to positively affect mood and quality of life in people with depression and serious illnesses. So they've been studied in numerous clinical trials have been shown to be safe and have positive in, impacts on um, patients. And so now we're going to be studying this in patients with ALS with a depressed mood and to see whether it has a positive impact on depression, quality of life, and overall ALS function. And so it's going to be a, um, a 24 a treatment seeking patients with ALS, as well as a depression. It's going to be an eight week course of study where patients will receive psilocybin in two different sessions. I guess what I would emphasize as part of this study is uh, what was previously thought as a psychedelic, given in smaller quantities, is now gaining steam for a potential treatment for a variety of different uh, disorders as we, as we move forward. So stay tuned for the potential um, uh, as we gear up to be doing this uh, study um, here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, here in green on the left are some of the uh, studies, both uh, clinical trials as well as um, research studies being conducted um, in ALS here at um, Johns Hopkins. Um, and, um, and I apologize, there's one there um, that is not currently active. TPN 101 is not currently active. Um, uh, and then on the right is a, just a sampling uh, in red of patient um, studies that are either um, have enrolled patients or are still following patients or studies that we have completed uh, recently in the context of ALS. And those are both research studies and clinical trials, just to give you a flavor for the activity that's occurring, um, at least here at our institution. So ALS is a neurodegenerative disease that primarily affects motor neurons, um, but is increasingly being recognized as a multi-system um, disease. 
Uh, the diagnosis relies primarily on history and physical examination. There are a number of genes associated with ALS, either as a causative or a risk factor, and the numbers of those is growing. Um, there's a lot of heterogeneity to the disease, and it's likely that there are multiple cellular targets, both within motor neurons as well as other cell types like microglia and astrocytes that may play a role in disease onset and progression. And so it's likely going to be a multidisciplinary approach for ALS management. And there are numerous clinical trials for ALS targeting a number of different cellular targets that, be, that are being conducted uh, internationally. So what are some of the future directions? Develop better animal models of ALS that can aid in the study of novel therapeutics. I think this is particularly important in ALS patients. To invest in the development of better biomarkers for understanding disease and progression. Define the clinical and genetic subtypes of the disease that allow us to stratify patients into the most appropriate clinical trials. Continue to expand the therapeutic landscape. I've given you some, really just a sampling of a variety of different pathways of interest uh, and a variety of different clinical trials that are going on both at Hop Johns Hopkins nationally and internationally. So I think I will uh, probably stop there uh, and uh, invite questions if you have them. All right, thank you so much. We do have a few questions. Let me go ahead and pull them up. Are trials still restricted to those with ALS under 36 months? So um, it depends a little bit on the study. Um, I would say currently the 36 months is the, um, is the most liberal of those strategies. That said, I gave you one example of psilocybin, and I, I suspect that will be the inclusion criteria for that particular uh, trial will probably be more broad, but I can't yet speak to the specifics. Uh, but in general, I think that's right, that the, the vast majority of studies, both nationally and internationally, are uh, uh, primarily for patients who have had disease for less than 36 months. Do you see any new drugs coming to the market soon? Well, I, when you say coming to market, that is uh, FDA approval, I, I assume. So um, to my knowledge, um, I don't believe there are any current F, uh, drugs in front of the FDA uh, uh, that are being um, targeted for a specific approval uh, right now. I think there are a number of um, efforts that are uh, some closer than others to potentially ask the FDA for, um, for approval. But I don't think that I can think of uh, upfront there is anything that's uh, uh, an impending approval for a drug that uh, for for uh, all ALS patients. All right. We'll see if anybody will just see if anybody has any other questions. If you do have questions, please type them in the Q and A at either the bottom or the top of your screen. And Dr. Marigakis. Um, Thank you so much. This was very informative and much appreciated. As I say, we get a lot of folks asking these kind of questions about trials and drugs and uh, ALS. So I appreciate the time that you have given us for this. So well, oh, here we go. Why are EAPs so difficult to get into? They only take a small number of... Yes, I probably. Yeah. Um, I can't speak to the specifics of any one EAP. Um, we don't have any, um, we're not currently do I should say, doing any, any EAPs here. Uh, I think there are a variety of reasons. I think there are only certain, um, some of them can be, for example, availability of the medication. So a company um, makes only a certain amount of medication um, for an EAP. So they have certain limitations there in that respect. Um, there can be only um, um, there can be only uh, a certain number of you know spots, even like a clinical trial, because EAPs do require monitoring uh, by let's say an institution. Uh, in, in many ways, much like a clinical trial, there is some work involved. So, um, but oftentimes it's related to uh, expense and just the amount of drug available to a variety of different sites. Okay. 
Uh, psilocybin is not yet available. Okay. Uh, it'll be part of a clinical trial. Um, and you can kind of, if you want to keep an eye on our website here at Johns Hopkins, um, we'll be able to give more information. How are the, how are Radicava, uh, um, Riliazol and Relivrio monitored? I'm not sure if you mean monitored. Um, monitored for safety, uh, primarily the major safety issue uh, with Riliazol is liver enzyme abnormalities. Um, uh, and so those should be monitored really every three months. Uh, Radicava doesn't have a lot in the way, at least to my experience, in uh, significant side effects or abnormalities of um, monitoring. Uh, sodium phenylbutyrate uh, and Tadka, also known as Relivrio, um, can cause, because of the salt load, can cause some uh, edema. And so that should be mostly monitored clinically uh, for signs of um, uh, swelling or shortness of breath or things like that. Okay, we'll see if we have any. We have a few more minutes. If anybody else has any questions at all. Oh, there we go. Well, how effective are the three? I, I, the answer, we don't know yet. Um, so uh, as an example, um, because the drugs, because the third of the drug, uh, the last of the three R's, Relivrio just became available in really December of last year. It's only now that we're seeing patients on the first year of all three therapies together. So we really don't have a great sense for if the effects of all three drugs together are additive uh, and how well those are working um, in combination. So uh, um, I there will never be a formal clinical trial where those three are compared with placebo. We will probably, um, we'll get some real, what we call real world data as to whether there are um, shifts in, let's say, survival or breathing function over time. Um, and that'll also be weaved into additional clinical trials as other drugs are studied as well. So at this point, we really don't know how robust the effect of all three drugs together um, is going to be. Well, I guess what I would say is for Riliazol, uh, the question is, should blood tests be done annually? Some doctors are only doing blood tests annually. Should you have them started quarterly? Um, you know, everyone has their own strategy, and it may depend on how long you've been on the medication. So I, I would leave that up to your individual doctor. We, we, we try to do it really on every quarterly basis. Um, my opinion of Neurone. Well, I, I think it's certainly, you know, I invite all efforts. Um, I think that there are some very interesting stem cell strategies. And, um, you know, I, I think it's exciting that, um, that and, and my hope is that they will do a, a phase three study to really try to tease out um, what, in, if there is a particular patient population that will respond to that particular subtype, uh, pr that particular therapy. Um, the good news is I think there are lots of um, other traditional medications that are that are also that are currently in use that I think um, show equal um, interest. All right. Let's see if anybody has, we have just a few more minutes. See if anybody else has any. sharing my screen. Dr. Marigakis, I want to thank you for your time. I know how busy you are and you taking the time to do this means so much and it is truly, truly appreciated. Well, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure and uh, uh, we're certainly happy to uh, happy to see patients. I'm, um, I was happy to share uh, what I've learned and hopefully this will be a timely uh, introduction to some of the new therapeutics and new ideas that are coming our way in 2024. Well, thank you. So I'm going to check real quick. We do not have any other questions and answers. So Dr. Marigakis, you have a good day, rest of the day. And everybody out there, thank you so much for um, attending our webinar. And I hope everybody has a safe and happy holiday season and see y'all next year. Thank you, Dr. Marigakis. Thank you. Mm -hmm.